Remember those networks we used to create without an access point, the ad hoc networks? Well, let's talk about Apple Wireless directly. Hello, Fernando Munoz with Wireless LAN Professionals. Today's question has to do with Apple Wireless Direct Link. What is the impact of AWDL in our Wi-Fi network? Well, to understand how Apple Wireless Direct Link works, we have to remind ourselves about those networks that we used to create back in the day without an access point. We'll just have a device create its own network and start beaconing and other devices join and it just operated, you know, in its own way. It had advantages, but a lot of disadvantages. Well, Apple Wireless Direct Link is Apple's own Apple to Apple communication protocol. There is a group of guys, Milan, David, and Matthias, they uh, wrote a document and did some research. It's called uh, One Billion Apple Secret Sauce. It has to do with uh, AWDL. So I did some research to answer today's question. And yes, let's talk about AWDL. This protocol is created uh, by Apple devices. You know, when you are transferring a file using AirPlay or the way you communicate to your Apple TV or your watch or your iPad talking to your iPhone, or when you are configuring a new iPhone and your iPhone comes up brand new and says, oh, I want to transfer all the files from another iPhone, and it searches whatever iPhone is nearby, and then it starts transferring all the files. All of these Apple-to-Apple -Apple communications happen writing on AWD. So how does this work? Well, devices will create this network. Let's start with a packet capture and let's see how it works. Let's look at a sidecar. Yes, sidecar without any wires attached. The computer is making the iPad a secondary screen. That's fascinating. Let's look at this packet capture. Initially, there's just regular traffic. You're gonna see some beacon frames. You're gonna see probe requests, probe responses, just the normal traffic that we see in our network. I capture about 250,000 uh, frames. I color coded all of my Apple wireless direct link uh, frames with pink. So let's look at this master indication frame. This is the first AWDL frame out of this capture that we see. On top, we have uh, the, the uh, arrival time, all the uh, timestamps and the radio tab header information, the channel that it is using is channel, uh, using channel 149, the signal strength, it shows us also, very important, that this is a frame that is not going to the DS and it's not coming from the DS. So to DS and from DS is set to zero, zero. Meaning this frame is going from air to air. It's not touching your infrastructure. Also, there is uh, the source and transmitter address. This is device uh, sending this master indication frame and it goes to FFFFF. And there is a BSSID created by Apple. Also, we have an Apple Wireless Direct Link action frame information. This is a master indication frame. And looking down lower, it's going to have some availability windows. Uh, and it is always set to 16 transmit units. Each transmit unit is 1,024 uh, microseconds. It has some uh, the channel sequence that it's going to be using. It has the address of the master device and also a master metric. The first device that creates the network is going to self-assign a master metric and as other devices join that network, they will assign a different metric based on the software version that they're running and they may assign a lower or a higher based on who's got the newest uh, OS. Also on this uh, master integration frame, it highlights which ones are the social channels that Apple is going to be using. And by default, it's going to be using channel 6, 44, and 149. These are the preferred channels for this communication protocol to operate. Also, we will see all of the high throughput capabilities, all the 802.11n capabilities. It specifies that, yes, this device can use 40 megahertz wide channels. It also specifies uh, aggregation uh, at the MAC protocol data units and MAC service data units. 
all of that information is disclosed in this master indication frame. Also, we can see periodic synchronization frames. These frames are similar to the master indication frames, but they have less information. Both the master indication frames and the periodic synchronization frames are sent by any device. And even a device that is not the master can send the master indication frame, letting everybody know who the master is and the, what the MAC address of the master device is. And letting everybody know that that network has been created and showing all of the election parameters and showing the channels and showing the social channels and showing all of the information for any other device that joins that wants to join the network. Now the devices will, since they are using not only their high throughput capabilities, but if it's an if it is an AC device, it will also disclose all of its very high throughput capabilities. And also notice down here in this aversion element that it will disclose if it is an iOS uh, operating system or if it is watch or if it is a uh, Mac OS because each device is going to be disclosing this information. Okay, so this is the first part. How is the network set up? One device will create the network and other devices will join and they will start broadcasting master indication and periodic synchronization frames. There will be lots of these frames being sent at any interval. Some of the concerns that they originally had were with the privacy, security. Um, there is no authentication. I didn't have to authenticate, but it relies on upper layer security. For instance, if you want to share a file from your computer, that's when you go to you just bring this window here. It's like if I want to share this file and I go to share and I want to use AirDrop, the device will search for other devices nearby using iOS. And right now it's doing a discovery using Bluetooth. And yes, it found one device, it found another device. There is the iPad, there is another MacBook Pro. And if I choose one of these devices, then it's going to be uh, establishing that communication with those devices. Once the devices are joined and part of this domain, then they will use these channels that the master has uh, indicated and also the channel sequence and it will start transferring data. So the security at that level depends on if you are allowing contacts only or if you are allowing everyone to send you files or if the devices have received files off, it's just not going to participate. And also, if you are doing an Apple TV, then you're going to rely on the Apple TV having security and also having a passcode. So that when a device wants to stream from an iPhone or an iPad or a computer into an Apple TV, it's going to have to enter that passcode, that key code, so that it is an authorized device to transmit. Some of the other security uh, issues they had was initially they had the real MAC address being displayed. So they, even before the randomization of uh, MAC addresses that we've seen lately, they started doing that on their devices. For instance, if we look at some of the uh, traffic, the MAC addresses are randomized. When we talk about this randomization of addresses, we know that if the last character of the first octet ends in 26A or E, that is a randomized MAC address. Looking at our capturing here, let's look at this master indication frame. The address, like the infrastructure address that it has created is an EA, so that second character uh, ends in A, that means that that is a randomized address. If we look at the master address, yes, it is also randomized. If we look at the radio information, looking at the source and destination address, the source in this case, random. We look at any master indication, 102. This is another one that is randomized. Any of the periodic ones, notice that it's BE, the second character, 
is an E, meaning this is a random. If I apply the filter AWDL, out of the 250,000 frames that I capture, we will see that it is a small percentage, only 4%, about 9,000 frames were master indication and periodic synchronization frames. May not seem like much, but I'm just talking about two devices participating in this group. And all of these addresses that we see here, they end in 2, E, A, and there must be some sixes down there. But as you can see, all of these are randomized MAC addresses. Interestingly enough, in the example that I did over here, one of the devices, an Apple TV, did not randomize the MAC address. Also, another concern was that devices can hijack the accession and take over files or send other files that were not intended to the recipient. Uh, one of the uh, measurements against that vulnerability is that there is a threshold of RSSI. If the device is next 65 or weaker, then it's not going to be able to participate in this uh, network. Meaning that for you to be compromised, you're going to have to have the attacker be in close proximity of the devices that are participating on the network. DHCP and DNS, what is the impact of these services in our network? Well, Apple was aware that any overhead on our Wi-Fi network is unwanted. So for DHCP, these devices are not going to use uh, any network discovery protocol or ARP. So they will create their own IPv6 network using addresses uh, starting with FF, FE, FD, FC, which are private addresses. And they will assign addresses and in a way that they are not interfering with each other. If I apply the filter IPv6, now Wireshark is going to show me only the addresses that are sent using IPv6. And notice that, yes, all of the traffic that is generated with these addresses, if I click on any of those frames, we can look at the source and destination MAC address and notice that it is using randomized MAC addresses for source and destination. We are, yes, using this uh, BSS ID that is Apple and it is created for this network. The purple traffic that is TCP traffic, the light blue traffic, that's UDP traffic. Yes, the protocol will use UDP or it will use TCP, depending on what it's sending. In regards to DNS, Apple will create its own that local domain and it will create pointer records and it will create service records and TXT records for the host names with randomized names. Although, in our example, we did notice that the Apple TV had some records that were created using its real host name. It was not randomized. And also, on top of that, even though it is supposed to create randomized addresses and hide the identity of the device, this Apple TV that participated was not only the name was disclosed in clear text, Office Apple TV, but also the MAC address was revealed. This is the original MAC address. Maybe it was an older version of the Apple TV. So one of the advantages is that Apple will use the maximum capabilities of the device and the protocol. It already has a Wi-Fi chip and it uses entirely the Wi-Fi chip for this communication. So let's look at the capabilities. Some of them are the aggregation of protocol data units and service data units. Let's look at one of these. Notice that we, have, we could see in the aggregation uh, two and up to three uh, Mac service data units aggregated also and we apply the filter of WLAN underscore aggregate, 
I'm going to say about 16% of the traffic, about 42,000 frames are aggregated frames. Apple will use the abilities of the device to its maximum. And also notice that the capabilities of the device will be used wisely. We're using 256 QAM with two special streams, a data rate of 780 megabits per second. So it is using the, the maximum capabilities of the device. Now that we have seen how Apple creates its own network, how IP addressing and DNS are handled, and that the devices will use the maximum capabilities of the chipset, let's see what happens on the spectrum. In these examples, we use multiple ones. One of them, we transfer a big file from two devices using AirPlay. We also use iPhones and iPads transferring data to an Apple TV. In this first example, there is an incoming file. This device will accept it and look at channel 149 through 161. It is using an 80 megahertz wide channel. And yes, as you see the progress bar, the file is being transferred and the spectrum is being heavily utilized in this 80 megahertz wide channel with the primary channel being channel 149. It completes and now the spectrum shows that there's little activity. In the next example, we're going to see how we generate traffic with a Wi-Fi metric. It's just raw RF in primary channel 149. I will initiate the file transfer. It says there is a file coming. I say accept. And it is not coming. As you can see, there is activity there. Nothing's happening. I'm looking at channel 44. Remember those social channels, 149, 44. And also, in 2.4, channel 6 was listed as one of the channels you would use. Let's check in 2.4. As you can see, 2.4 shows little to no activity in channel 6. We go back to 5 gig. Channel 149 still shows occupied. I'm going to stop the Wi-Fi metrics. And immediately after, the energy tech threshold is not being tripped. Now my data is going through. Notice the progress of the file is being transferred. I'm going to start the Wi-Fi metrics again, generating some raw RF. And as soon as I do so, the traffic on the other secondary channels will stop, airdrop stops, and I look and see if it moves to channel 44. Nothing. As soon as I stop the Wi-Fi metrics, now my file has been transferred. So as you can see, in the spectrum, there will also be respecting the protocol. There is energy in the channel. The energy detect threshold is being tripped, so it will wait for its turn. It will contend and it will wait until the medium is available. It will not use the other social channels. It will just stay there and wait for the medium to become idle. In this example, we have transferred a video and we're streaming from our iPad to the Apple TV. Let's see what happens to our video. It's going normal, normal speeds. And when the traffic starts being generated, then you're going to notice in here that yes, channel 149 is being utilized and look at the quality of the video. Both video and audio become unstable. I paused it. Life's good. I'm going to activate it again. And our transmission becomes unstable. The quality of the video decreases and the audio also gets affected. Now we have looked at the transfer from the iPad to the Apple TV and it was interrupting the streaming. So the quality of the video was affected, the quality of the audio was affected. Let's see what happened to the frames during that period of time. In this example, we capture about 150,000 packets. And yes, you can see that all of the light blue and light purple frames are aggregated frames. Notice that yes, we have request to send and clear to send activated before each group of frames are sent. And then there is a block act at the end. There is constant traffic going through as we are streaming from our iPad to the Apple TV.
But notice that while we were generating that traffic, all of these packets that were being sent were being retransmitted. All of these frames highlighted in yellow are retransmissions, TCP retransmissions, because the frames were being damaged. It didn't go to other social channels 6 or 44. It just stayed there and waited till the medium to be clear until it finally did, and the traffic just kept going. So this is the impact of that. In conclusion, what does that mean for us as Wi-Fi designers? Well, we have to consider that if we have Apple devices in our network, and in most cases we do, then perhaps channel 149 is not going to be a good channel to have in our channel plans. The presence of Apple devices will create this Apple-to-Apple communications, AirPlay, AirDrop, and any streaming that you do, like Sidecar, doing, going to the Apple TV, and any Apple-to-Apple -Apple communications will use the Wi-Fi chipset on the devices, and even though they are playing by the rules and following the 802.11 standard, they will have an impact on our networks, because every time they are transmitting, they will be using airtime. And if there are APs in channel 149 or one of the other channels in that space, then they're going to be contending with this Apple to Apple communications. They will be using airtime and they will be increasing the amount of management and control frames that we're going to see in those areas. As a conclusion, yes, it is a good, very good protocol. It allows us to communicate between Apple devices without touching our infrastructure. 2DS and from DS will be set to 00, which is good, it doesn't touch our APs. It doesn't use IP addresses from our DHCP server. It's not gonna hit our DNS servers either. All of this is maintained and contained within the Apple environment. But just keep in mind that the impact that it's gonna have is an airtime utilization and yes, even though it is following the rules of the protocol, it's going to be using airtime. You're going to be sharing the channel with these devices. So if you are supporting your Apple devices, maybe you're going to have to change your network because Apple is not going to change anything to work on your network. It has some social channels, 644 and 149. We tried this in Europe and channel 44 was the preferred channel given the regulatory domain where Uni3 channels or band C channels have a restriction, then it will just default to channel 44. We did the exact same te test in the UK and it just didn't work in channel 149 or 6, it stayed in channel 44. So that's another consideration for you. Hopefully that answers your questions. If you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to us. If you want to learn more about how Wi-Fi works, join us. WLAMPros.com is the site. We have lots of resources and other training videos in there. Thanks for being part of the community. Fernay Muñoz, have a great time.